we are um, preach, making our way through this prophet Isaiah, uh, through this uh, season of Advent, which began at the beginning of December and leads up to Christmas. It's a season of, of waiting, of preparation, of hope, of expectation. So let's pray that uh, the Spirit stirs some of those things up in us uh, as we look at this amazing passage uh, together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, a prophet speaking thousands of years into his own situation can speak to us today because of the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Father, send your Holy Spirit on us now. We might hear what it is you have to say to us today. That we might be faithful followers of Jesus as we wait for his return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Advent is all about this waiting. So it is anticipating Christmas and remembering that Jesus has already come. But then there's also something about waiting as his disciples for his second coming, when he returns to make everything right. But of course, the reality is we live in the present. We, we live now. So we look back to the past of Jesus' first coming. We look forward to the future of his second coming. But we live in our present. And our present can feel very ordinary, can't it? What is ordinary life like for you? Right now, this week, what is ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill life like? Your day-to-day -day existence. What is it like? Perhaps you share one of these two experiences which I think are common to us all. There's the monotony of life, isn't there? The daily routine. For me, it's children getting up before the alarm goes off. It's the morning routine of clothing a child and then clothing and feeding yourself. I feed the child too, just so in case you're worried. Um, <laughs> For many of you, it will be commuting to work. Mine is a seven-minute walk. That's a great joy in many ways. Uh, then it is work at the desk in the office, or uh, maybe you are working from home. Uh, then it's the commute home. Then it's the bedtime routine. Maybe then you allow yourself to have a little bit of dinner and sit down and, or collapse in a heap in exhaustion and watch TV until you then go to bed and you wake up and you do the same thing. And it feels mundane. It feels boring day after day after day until suddenly you find this ordinary life overwhelmed by events. Something breaks into that ordinary life. Something extraordinary. Maybe you lose your job or you lose a loved one. Maybe a member of your family gets sick or ill. And you move home. You move church. Something changes. And so that feels either out of the blue, where something kind of comes in left field, disrupts and disturbs your ordinary life, and creates this whole sense of upheaval, or perhaps it's just a gradual build-up as you feel the pressure cooker of your life getting more and more intense, and you find things get on top of you. I wonder how those experiences that I think are common to us all make you feel. I feel like I'm struggling to breathe sometimes. That it's hard to stay afloat. It's like surfing a wave and the wave is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it sometimes feels like it might even be a tsunami. And I'm just holding my balance. But I know at some point I'm going to go crashing into that wave and struggle to breathe. And you know, that's how the people of Judah felt when Isaiah was writing this extraordinary piece of literature. Life was tough for them. They were poor. Food was scarce. There was no health care. There was no uh, welfare. There were no jobs. They eked out a subsistence existence. They grew their own food for their own families. And if they could, they might sell the excess if they had any excess. Life was nasty, brutish, and short. And then Syria invades. And Judah, a, a place surrounded by these powerful empires, suddenly finds itself invaded by one of them. They had been flirting with Egypt, one empire, trying to find a little bit protection of protection. And then, as a response, Assyria invades them. They see on the distance Babylon, that one day a powerful nation, is slowly but surely on the rise. And they try and make plans to protect themselves. But King Hezekiah provokes 
the Assyrian king Sennacherib because he approaches the Egyptians. And here we find Jerusalem is under siege. There is a genuine threat of extinction for the people of God. And Isaiah is writing as this scenario works itself out. And what is he talking about? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about salvation. And he says four things about salvation that we're going to look at this morning. He, he says salvation means abundance. Salvation means strength. Salvation means everything. And salvation means assurance. So let's begin with this idea that salvation means abundance. It's there in the first few verses, if you want to turn to it, page 682. We're simply going to work through the text, so it's good to have it open in front of you if you can. He starts off, this is how it is, the land is barren. Three times he tells us it is a desert, it is a parched land, it is the wilderness. This is an arid place that he is describing. It is the place that the people of God inhabit it is a place of drought. It is a place where life is precarious, where resources are scarce, where existence is hard. Life is sterile in this land. Creation's fruitfulness, the way God had originally intended it to be, has been denied. Things are not as they should be. And life, our lives, can feel just like that, can't they? Perhaps we have no job security or we are daunted by the cost of housing and we're struggling to pay the rent or the mortgage or the bills because our income is low and we live in London. Maybe we're wrestling with loneliness or isolation. We wonder where the next relationship is going to be. Or perhaps our spiritual life is feeling just a little bit fragile. The land is barren, says Isaiah. But then, he says, the land will be fertile. There, right at the beginning of the reading, verse 2. This abrupt change is promised. The desert bursts into bloom. Out of the blue, there is this inst instantaneous transformation. Three times he says it again. Lebanon, Carmel, Sharon. Those were the three most fertile areas in the whole land. God just doesn't promise that things will just start coming back. He promises fertility. He promises this abundance, the rehabilitation of creation as it blossoms and flourishes where abundant life in all its fullness bursts out and the desert itself will rejoice and sing just as it should be. And of course, this life that has come from nowhere is a gift. It's given to us. The glory and splendor of this abundance comes from God himself. Just as James says in the New Testament, uh, God's the father of lights who gives good gifts to his children. And these gifts of creation are glorious and to be celebrated. But there is more than that. Because Isaiah says God gives his own glory and splendor to his people. God gives himself. So where God gives himself, abundance overwhelms scarcity. What an amazing vision the prophet gives us. But I don't know about you, but I find life rarely feels like that vision. We'd love it to, we want it to be true, but it doesn't feel like that. Change never seems to be that dramatic or complete. And so we're tempted to wonder whether this is just an escape that the prophet gives the people in the face of a terrible, daunting reality. Maybe this is just naive, this is fantasy, not faith. But he goes on. He says, salvation means strength, verses 3 and 4. You look here, the people are disabled. Three times again he says it to emphasize the point. They have feeble hands. Their knees are unsteady. They have fearful hearts. I saw this kind of weakness over the last six months as my mother-in-law and then my father both died of cancer. And you could see the physical decline of their bodies. They begin to walk more slowly. Then they find it's difficult to actually move or get up. 
Then they find it's difficult not just to get up, but even to sit up. Their muscles begin to atrophy, and they get weaker and weaker. Find the most difficult thing I think I saw with my dad was how difficult he found it even to take a sip of water in the final days of his life. He was wasting away physically. And perhaps it's been that experience, but I certainly find life can sometimes feel more like that. We can feel helpless. We can wrestle with the disappointment that life throws at us. We can struggle with a sense of failure both in ourselves and in others. And we can waste away on the inside. We can struggle with a loss of confidence. We can feel despondent. But the prophet says in verse 4, that we can be strong. In fact, he's so confident in that, he gives it as a command. He says, strengthen yourself. Be steady, be strong, do not fear. And he's not saying it at some time in the future. He's saying right now, in this place, today, in this moment, you can be strong. In fact, you must be strong. How can he say such a thing? Because he is confident God has already given the people of God all that they need, all that we need. You see, the situation that they're facing hasn't changed. Sennacherib is knocking on the door of Jerusalem. The desert hasn't blossomed yet. They are still in the wilderness. But Isaiah says, don't look around at what's going on. Look up. In the Hebrew, he actually says, behold your God. In our version, it gets to it quite quickly. He says, uh, your God will come. It just starts with saying, behold your God. Just look at him. Consider him. Ponder him. Wonder at him. Worship him. That is where it begins. And he announces to us God's presence, even in the desert. He is here, even in the wilderness. The prophet, the word of God, makes him visible. This insurgent God that breaks in, that takes responsibility, that takes charge of our situation. And then he says, God is going to do something. There's this prophetic promise of what he will do. And again, he says three things. He says, God will take vengeance for wrongs suffered. Right, um, he will right what has been wronged. He, chaos will be ordered. Sickness will be healed. Life will be restored once more. He will take vengeance. There will be recompense for wrong that has been done to us. Justice and mercy are promised by Isaiah. And finally, thirdly, there will be salvation. Deliverance, liberation, freedom. God, says Isaiah, will one day make things right. This is our hope. Not just his hope, not just the people of Israel's hope, our hope as followers of Jesus. Hope for the future. And of course, hope changes everything. And it is this promise of salvation that gives us hope. Nothing has changed yet, but it will change. We are waiting, but we are not in despair. We are not in frustration. We are waiting in hope, in anticipation, in expectation. There is excitement. There are possibilities. God is on the move. And this is faith, not fantasy. And it is this that we need to live today. And Isaiah kind of unpacks this hope that we have. He takes us kind of deeper into it. And he reminds us that salvation means everything. Look at verses 5 to 7. This promise of salvation that he offers is amazing. It's not just saving souls. Not just human beings escaping to heaven one day. This is the restoration of all things, of creation, both the environment we live in and our hearts. Both what is outside of us and what is inside of us. And Isaiah describes this hope that we have to thens. Do you notice, then this will happen in verse 5. Then this will happen in verse 6. This is what it means, he's saying. 
This is what will happen. Disabilities will be overcome. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will leap, the dumb will sing. Scarcity is overcome, he says. The wilderness will become water. The desert will become streams. The burning sand a pool. The thirsty ground will bubble up like springs of water. Creation promises the prophet will be rejuvenated. Life will spring up from death. And the powers of death and disease and decay will be broken. And hope in this extraordinary salvation has a profound effect on us. And the fourth thing the prophet says is salvation means assurance. Look at verses 8 to 9. Isaiah desperately wants us to believe the message he has been given. And he pictures this highway. It's not the highway to hell. No, it's not the highway out there, though it is becoming so. Is the highway of holiness built in the desert. And I wonder what image that conjures up for you. Rick, quite rightly, when he uh, uh, preached this sermon, spoke of the highway as an image of what could be in this place. Is it when it's full of traffic and you're riding along on your bike and there are huge lorries threatening to knock you off? Is that the image that comes into your mind? Maybe... uh, It's uh, actually an image of uh, when you are on one of those moving walkways in an airport and you just watch people go by as you keep walking and suddenly you're going much, much faster than they are. Actually, I prefer to see it as a picture of cycling on on a clear road. We have a little tradition when there is a, an event on, a triathlon or the marathon or whatever, if you come early enough, it's absolutely completely clear and you lie down on it. I've got a photo of Darren like this lying on the road and I had the joy of, uh, of, of riding through London it's main artery just a little bit uh, south of, Tower, of um, Tower Bridge with the sky ride when there were no cars anywhere there were quite a lot of cyclists but no cars and just to have the whole road to ride in was an extraordinary experience that is the image that Isaiah is conjuring up for us here. What he's saying is salvation, your salvation and mine, is secure. The highway has no cars. There are no threats. There's nothing dangerous. It's a safe road offering safe passage. And it is made for you and me. It's made, he says, for the re- uh, ransomed. Those who have been rescued, literally, the, rede- sorry, the, um, the redeemed, those who have been rescued is, is the ransomed. And what he's saying there is God is our next of kin. He is our kinsman redeemer. In ancient Israel, you had the idea that if the rest of your family had died, your closest, re- your nuclear family if you like, your closest relative would have responsibility to take care for you. And they would take that responsibility. And they would demonstrate care and affection, demonstrate solidarity with this family member. And here Isaiah is saying, God is just like that. He is your family. He's the strong member of your family that takes care of you, the weak member of your family. He offers you protection and care. Isaiah is also saying, he is our master. He has um, ransomed us. He has bought us back from slavery to the principalities and powers of this world. He has paid our debts. He has released us from bondage. And we belong to him now. And he takes responsibility for you and for me. And so we can be confident in this salvation. We don't need to worry. We can enjoy anxiety-free living. We can reject insecurity. We can know assurance And so Isaiah says these amazing things. Salvation means abundance. Salvation means strength. Salvation means everything. Salvation means assurance. But why should we believe it? Why should we hope like Isaiah hopes? Isn't it really just a daydream? Isn't it really just a fantasy? How do we move from fantasy to faith 
Why should we believe? Well, it's because salvation is also Jesus. Salvation is Jesus. You see, Isaiah is looking to the future. He is interpreting the events of his day in light of this hope in the future. And chapters uh, 36 to 39, read them if you will, come just a little bit after this chapter. They demonstrate God's faithfulness in history. Jerusalem is saved. Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, retreats and is eventually killed by his sons. Judah, this tiny land, is delivered And yet it remains, that hope remains incomplete because Babylon is rising in power. And Hezekiah, like an idiot, shows them all his treasures. And so they one day will come back and be an even greater threat than Assyria. The threat remains. There is more to be done. Isaiah is still waiting. But for us, as followers of Jesus, the future has already begun. The New Testament says the hope that Isaiah speaks of here is fulfilled in Jesus. You remember John asks Jesus if he is the Messiah, God's king, his representative. And Jesus replies by painting Isaiah's picture. Luke 7 says this, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. The woman at the well, she asks for water, and Jesus promises her living water gushing up from within her. There they are in the middle of the desert where water is scarce and Jesus promises living water. In John's Gospel, in chapter 7, at the Feast of Tabernacles, he says, If anyone is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Paul, in his letter to Corinthians, in chapter 10, says Jesus is the rock And he's looking back to this time in the wilderness where Moses strikes the rock because they're all um, dying of thirst and water comes out of it. And Paul says that rock was Jesus. Isaiah is describing here what we know to be resurrection life. And Jesus has already been raised so we can be confident that this resurrection life is available to us. We have tasted the future. That's why we believe. That's why we can hope. That's why it is not fantasy, it is faith. And so finally, salvation brings joy. Verse 10. Salvation results in this resounding singing. This is real. This is true. And it makes you want to sing about it. Isaiah comes back to this again and again. It's shot throughout the reading. Joy, gladness, singing. God has done it. God is doing it. God will do it. So we can move away from fantasy to faith and we can celebrate. We can sing our hearts out this Advent. So I just want to leave you with three easy things to help you put that into practice, to help it become a reality in your life. The first thing is to look at the book. Get to know the end of the story, the hope that Isaiah has. That it's not escape, it's not retreat, It's not a restart of a different world altogether. It is the renewal of the universe. The renewal of all that is. And keep reminding yourself of the story that you are part of. And then, don't just look at the book. Look around you. Where do you see signs of that future breaking in? Signs of what we call the kingdom of God. And put yourself in the line of fire. John Hayes from Interchange was speaking this morning on this same passage and he spoke about an experience he had um, in Cambodia where he had seen the difference hope made to a desperate situation where 
a hospital with no resources whatsoever, with AIDS patients left in the corridors dying with no hope, how Christians have gone in, shared this vision of Isaiah, and those AIDS patients had got off their beds and begun to minister to one another. And then he brought it home to us and he said, and I saw that this week as Leanne led the community choir and people from the night shelter, the homeless, came in and didn't join the choir. They were the choir and they found their voice and they sang together. This, he said, is the vision of Isaiah 35. He put himself in the line of fire where he would see those glimpses of the future. And we must do the same. So look at the book, look around you, and finally, sing your heart out. I was enjoying time with uh, Amelia uh, and Orla and Joanne at her school nativity. And uh, we were talking to our friends uh, who were kind of getting used to their child singing. And we have been a family that have sung since the first day that she was born. I like singing. Um, and, uh, and you could see that sense of, wow, that's a, that's a good thing to do together. And so when we gather, let's sing. When we are by ourselves in the presence of God, let's sing. Sing our hearts out. Sing with abandon. We'll become even more undignified than this. Because our hearts are full of the joy of our salvation. The salvation that Isaiah foresaw. Let's pray together. Why don't we stand?